This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 27, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcasts of our discussions following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, During the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why we believe Walker's labor endorsements actually strengthen Mark Begich's message. Second, we compare the strengths and weaknesses of the fiscal and oil plans of the Alaska governor candidates. And third, we talk about what's up with the surge these past couple of weeks in analyst and trade press coverage of Alaska oil. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Yep, that's it right there. Brad Keithley comes in every week. Again, oil, gas, politics, and whatever ails us, he is uh, the one to talk with us about it. He comes in to get down into the weeds. He joins us this morning uh, to discuss the politics of the situation and where we're going in the state. Good morning, Brad. How are you doing? Michael, I'm doing great today. How are you? You know what? No complaints. I, like I said earlier in the chat room, I feel like it's a Monday for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, I mean, it's not necessarily just bad. It's just kind of weird. So um, let's uh, let's talk a little politics here uh, because that's our foie te, um, or foie gras, one of the two. Uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the big labor endorsement. Uh, we heard some things that I just saw this morning that uh, the labor union has walked back a part of their statement yesterday that they reported that talks were underway to try and turn it into a two-way race. They walked that back yesterday, last evening, to say, oh, no, no, we have no idea. We hear there's talks, but we're not part of anything. But how does Walker's labor endorsement, uh, you know, how does that affect Mark Begich, in your opinion? Well, the conventional wisdom would be it hurts Begich because it takes out a part of the traditional Democrat uh, vote, uh, a part of the traditional Democrat uh, support group that gets out there uh, and, and, and helps fund campaigns and, and, and gets out uh, and, and does mailers and, and walks the districts. Um, and takes away part of his funding because uh, labor traditionally supports the Democrat uh, candidate. And so I, the, tr- the, the conventional wisdom, I think, that people have settled into is this is a blow to Begich uh, and that, uh, that, that Mark may be reconsidering uh, whether to maintain the run in light of the twin endorsements by AFL-CIO and NEA, the National Education Association of Alaska, uh, of, uh, of Walker. Frankly, if I, I think if Mark, if Mark looks at this and spins it right and steps out and calls a spade a spade, uh, I think this actually helps uh, Begich. Here's the, here's the deal with Walker. Walker, Walker is, is trying to appeal to two groups. Uh, the first is those who want additional state spending, and that certainly is AFL-CIO, which is – any more uh, mostly run by uh, public sector, public public employee uh, unions, um, and NEA, which certainly is is a government funded group. So he's trying to appeal to uh, the government, uh, these government funded uh, government sector groups, um, and and is successful in doing that by promising essentially more government spending. But the funding of that more government spending uh, is something that is not. Uh, family friendly, working family friendly, which is which is what the these groups uh, uh, tend to say they represent. What how Walker's trying to fund this additional spending is by cutting the PFD, 
And the only group that benefits from cutting the PFD is the top 20 percent by income of Alaskans, who, who frankly, because because the PFD is such a small part of, of their income, uh, really just grazes uh, as it goes by. The real impact of cutting the the PFD is on middle income and lower income Alaskans. Uh, and, and as ICER has said, it has by far the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, which is driven by middle and lower income Alaskans. Uh, and it is, it is by far the costliest uh, of all of the various new revenue options on Alaska families, on the remaining 80 percent, the other 80 percent of Alaska families. So I think Begich, is, I think Begich has the opportunity to say, look, and Begich has the opportunity to become the real independent in the race, the, the one that's really not beholden to on, – on the, on the left side, really not beholden to the special interests. He can say, look, you know, labor wants increased government spending. Okay, fine. Maybe we need to have a little bit of increased government spending. But we, don't, but we need to fund it through all Alaskans. All Alaskans need to contribute to this. And what Bill Walker is doing is trying to fund it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaskans. I, Mark Begich, uh, will fund it much more fairly uh, across the entire specter of Alaskans. I won't push it to middle and lower income Alaskans. Bill Walker is trying to be elitist, uh, and he's trying to, to do – fund government on the backs of, of working Alaska families. I'm Mark Begich. I represent working Alaska families. And, and really sort of go after that economic message that I think is a valid one uh, and, and really, really try, try to paint Walker, Walker as, as the elitist in the race, as the one who's trying to protect the top 20 percent um, and, and, and make sure they don't have to pay a proportionate share and that Begich is the one looking out for middle income and lower income Alaska. So, I mean, you're basically saying you're, he's broadening his appeal by uh, by doing this. He has a potential, anyway, to broaden his appeal with a base that may not necessarily, you know, that if he had been supported by labor, may not have even looked at him here. And now this kind of makes him look like the David in, of the Goliath kind of thing. Is that is that kind of what it, I'm hearing? It, it does. I'm, I mean, it allows him to be, the tr- as I as I say, and, and we'll get to Mike Dunleavy here in a bit. I'm not trying to discount Dunleavy at all. But, but I, it allows Begich to become much more independent, I think, uh, than he would have been had he gotten got labor, labor endorsements, endorsements or, or even, even if labor had remained neutral in the race and Begich had to be concerned about labor flipping on him toward the end. They, tried, they, they sort of tried to hold – would hold uh, Mark's feet to the fire. So I, I, think, I think Begich can really go full, full-on economic – I don't want to say populist, but full-on uh, middle-income and lower-income Alaskan uh, advocate uh, because of what labor's done. They've really untethered him from from this obligation to sort of you know stay stay tight with what labor has taken as the cut the PFD approach uh, of how to fund Alaska government. And Begich, I think, can talk about things like all Alaskans paying a fair share, a proportionate share. Uh, of the cost of government as opposed to Walker, who wants to shift that burden uh, off the top 20 percent and on to uh, middle income and lower income Alaskans. You know, it's interesting to see the reactions on Facebook. You posted this, you posited this on your on your Alaskans for Sustainable Budget page, and somebody was just like, well, you can't be this stupid that you think this is a good thing. Uh, when I think you're talking in abstracts here, as far as the, the the abstract value of each candidate and what they bring to the table as far as opening the discussion, uh, again, I don't think that was an endorsement of Walker. I think it was or an endorsement of baggage. I think it was more he's going to be a stronger voice on this issue as far as not cutting the PFD, which I welcome it from any candidate who wants to bring that to the table. Uh, and as you said, not discounting Dunleavy. I think sometimes people get stuck in a they they can't see beyond the the comp the, the biases that they have in their own mind towards their party and this is quite honestly why i have a problem with the whole two-party dichotomy is because people get locked into their tracks and they can't see over the edge of the track over to the other lane to see what's going on because it must be wrong it's not in their lane and that that really bothers me sometimes yeah and, and it's not an it's not an endorsement of baggage but what what I think this brings to the race is another voice on the PFD. What, what it creates the opportunity for in this race is another voice on the PFD issue saying, look, 
the PFD, the, the PFD is important. It serves an important role in the overall Alaska economy. It is it has the largest bang for the buck of any state expenditure in terms of income, increasing overall state income and increasing uh, jobs. Uh, that shocks some people, but it is. Uh, that's what the ICER analysis says. It is it is uh, cutting it has by far the the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. The remaining 80 percent of Alaska families, it 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 creates the opportunity that that issue uh, gets out there and gets pressed in a way uh, in a way that's going to be different than the, than I think the way that that Dunleavy is pressing it, um, and I think is going to give uh, create the opportunity for a lot more. Uh, discussion about the PFD uh, in this race. There's there's a lot of misunderstanding, uh, I think, about the role that the PFD plays, uh, and even about what the legislature has been doing with the PFD. There was an article in the Juno Empire by somebody that I think is otherwise a pretty good uh, a pretty good reporter on these things uh, that talked about uh, the PFD. That, that the reason people were upset. Uh, is because uh, the PFD was a, a secondary issue, and it sort of got cut by SB 26, but it really wasn't the really wasn't the critical issue. And I and, and I think people, I think James Brooks, uh, uh, the reporter at the Empire, and I think others just don't have a good grasp uh, on what the PFD is doing. The 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 press has been reporting what Walker has been saying, and what legislators who want to cut the PFD uh, and look out for the top 20 percent have been saying. And I think. Baggage brings – this creates an opportunity untethered from labor, untethered from the need to, to, to sort of kowtow to labor. I think this creates the opportunity for baggage to bring that discussion much more to the forefront than, than it's been before. As you can see, we had something of a technical glitch at this point. Michael essentially is asking me to move on to the second point uh, of the top three a comparison of the strengths and weaknesses of the fiscal and oil plans of the three uh, candidates for governor. Uh, I start with uh, Walker and Begich and then move on to Dunleavy. Yeah, I, uh, we've talked a little bit about, about Walker and Begich here. I, I think what, what we're having, certainly with the, with the labor endorsements and the split that's showing up, I think we're having a fairly clear, an early delineation of what the economic plans of the various candidates are going to be. Uh, Walker's plan is to keep state spending high, uh, but fund it through PFD cuts. Uh, fund it uh, through the most regressive tax you can come up with. Fund it off the backs of middle income and lower income Alaskans. Uh, and and Walker's going to continue to press uh, those two those two approaches. One, I'm going to I'm going to keep spending high to satisfy my labor friends, and two, uh, I'm going to keep cutting the PFD because that's uh, that's what my top 20 percent, my donor base. Uh, wants me to do. Begich, on the other hand, uh, the, the second candidate, I think his, uh, again, these labor endorsements sort of clarify where Begich can go on this. I think Begich can say is, is that, look, I'm the, I'm the candidate that's looking out for the middle and lower income Alaskans. Um, I think that we, now Begich is going to have to tr say, tr keep with traditional Democrat values of saying we're going to keep spending fairly high. We're going to keep our universities. We're going to keep three universities. We're going to uh, keep um, uh, uh, K through 12 uh, funding high. Uh, we're going to do the things that, that this is Mark speaking. My brother Tom has advocated uh, in the state uh, in the state Senate. Uh, but I'm going to pay for it differently than, than Walker is. I'm not going to pay for it through uh, on the backs of middle and lower income Alaskans. I'm going to pay for it through, I suspect Begich is going to bring up oil taxes, right. uh, getting getting an additional share from the oil companies. And Begich, I think, is going to probably talk about an income tax. Now, it sort of depends uh, about what kind of income tax he talks about, uh, you know, how the reaction is going to be. Uh, but, but I think Begich is going to talk about we're not going to fund this. Uh, it opens the opportunity for him to say we're not going to fund this through uh, middle income and on the backs of middle income and lower income Alaskans uh, families, the remaining 80 percent, the other 80 percent of Alaska families, we're going to fund it by spreading this burden fairly. And the top 20 cent, top 20 percent is going to pay a share uh, uh, of funding just like uh, uh, it, it differently than 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 what Walker's trying to, to do uh, to do right now. So, so th th those are where I think Walker and uh, and, and Beggy are headed. And it's a, I think that's a great discussion uh, for, for the two of them to have over on the, on the left side. 
and then you have and, and then you have Dunleavy. Well, and, let's and, and before we about this. yeah before we get into Dunleavy, I got about I got less than sixty seconds here, but let me ask you this: How does this play out between Baggage and Walker on the rural vote? Since the rural communities depend so heavily on the PFD, Walker, of course, was the culprit in this in two years, complicit in this, and now three years. Baggage has been very pro-PFD. Does this help with that kind of man of the people thing, especially since he didn't get the union endorsement? I think what I think what Baggage does in the rural areas is say, look, I, the rural areas are dependent on government spending. So Baggage is going to say, I'm going to continue moderately government spending we can find efficiencies we can find ways to to lower costs elsewhere but i'm gonna i'm gonna make sure the rural areas are taken care of but i'm not gonna do it on the backs of middle income and lower income alaskans which is a large segment of the rural areas so i think it gives him an opening to really attack walker uh in in the rural areas as walker being an elitist trying to shift this burden away from the top 20 percent on to middle income and lower income Alaskans. I think it gives him a way clearly to attack Walker in, in, in rural Alaska. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We will be back with more here in just a moment on the Michael Duke Show. It is your home for common sense, liberty based, free thinking radio. Okay, and we're clear with Brad. Brad, let's come back to it here. Um, in the chat room, Harold asked the question. Um, between Baggage and Walker, where do you see – I mean, who do you see is the better outcome from Alaska? I mean, if it's a choice of two bads, which, I mean, in my opinion, I mean, it's not Brad's opinion, but as a choice of two bads, which one is the better outcome for Alaska in that race? Um, well, I don't want anybody let – me, let me preface this and, and, and bookend it at the other end by saying I don't want anybody to interpret this as, as, as an endorsement uh, of one candidate or the other. But clearly, Begich is, in my view, has the much better message um, uh, between those two candidates and is, and is much better for Alaska. Now, you know, Begich can go extreme and really, and really hurt things. He can, if he overdoes the discussion about oil taxes, says he's going to send us back to ACES, for example, that's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot. If he talks about a progressive income tax um, where you're sort of tilting, you're, you're flipping the balance instead of favoring – uh, the top 20% as Walker does now, you're favoring the middle and lower income and you're penalizing the top 20%. I think that's a bad thing uh, and, and, has, and has some harmful effects. But, but if, if you just sort of accept that, that Walker is, is the top 20%, spend all you can on state employees candidate, uh, and Baggage represents something more moderate than that, uh, let's spread the burden wider much more broadly – uh, and 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 I, Begich does talk about efficiencies. Um, I, I think Begich is much the better candidate between those two. Now, having prefaced that by saying that's not an endorsement, let me end it by saying that's not an endorsement uh, of Begich. I mean, we're not talking about Dunleavy in this conversation, right? Which I think is the better of the three candidates. But but of those two, I think I think that's I, I think Mark's the better candidate. Here's the question: Can Mark get funding um, for that message? Um, labor is traditionally a big source of funding, both in support of the candidate and in support and in and in uh, independent expenditures. Um, if you take that away and give that over to Walker, uh, can Mark can the Democrat Party rise up and can Mark's traditional supporters uh, that he's had for his mayor races and for his Senate race Senate races can he get enough funding to get that message out? I think that's potentially where the where the endorsements hurt Mark the most. Not not in terms of in, in terms of being supported by an organization, but in terms of funding. So Mark needs to get that funding to get that message out to to to, to, to play the role that that I think he has the capability of playing now. Uh, but if he does, I, I think I think he's got the better message between the two. Sorry, I had my mic muted there for a second because I don't like that. We get that echo feedback with Brad. The question was, you know, in the pa in the privacy of the ballot box, they may be endorsed by the union. Walker may be endorsed by the union. But do they end up voting for Begich or Dunleavy because of the effect that the taking of the PFD had uh, on their families? I mean, they're not all top 20 percent income earners. And so they the union may endorse uh, may endorse uh, Walker. But the question is, would, would Dunleavy and Begich still see some support inside the ballot box? Yeah, I think I think what Begich, the subliminal message, and maybe the the the, the on the surface message that Begich says is, 
I'm going to do the same thing Walker does in terms of spending. Uh, don't worry about me, you know, abandoning abandoning labor. But you individual workers, I'm looking out for you. I'm I'm truly looking out for working families, as opposed to what the the labor unions are doing, which is really looking out for the top 20 percent. I am the working family candidate because I'm the one who's not going to fund this. I'm going to find other ways than funding it on your backs. Walker wants to put all of this on you, the average union worker. He wants to put it on your back, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to protect working families from bearing the burden uh, of, of government spending. So I, it, 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 his appeal has got to be directly to the union members and the middle-income and lower-income uh, Alaskans sort of over the heads or around the side or underneath the, the, the union leadership saying, I'm the one who's really looking out for working Alaska families, not uh, not Walker. Hi, welcome back to it. It is the Michael Duke Show. Common Sense Radio, it's what we do each and every day from 6 to uh, 8 a.m. Uh, everywhere around the world in the state of Alaska and on Facebook Live as well. Joining me right now is Brad Keithley who is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, uh, he comes on every week to get down in the weeds with us on the details of what things need to, uh, to, you know, what needs to happen to try and bring the state back on track. Brad, before we went to break, we were talking about, um, you know, the differences between the candidates, their different economic policies, the weaknesses and strengths of their fiscal and oil plans. You had got into kind of the baggage walker comparative, and now we need to bring Dunleavy on. Yeah, absolutely. So... Beggage and Walker are, are, are likely fo- more focused on maintaining current spending. The difference between the two of them is how they pay for it. Walker does it through PFD cuts. Beggage would li- will likely do it through a much broader uh, revenue base to pay for it. Dunleavy brings something entirely different. Dunleavy uh, uh, brings, I'm going to cut the budget, uh, and I'm going to get it down to a level – uh, that it's that that it's sustainable from current revenue sources without taking extraordinary steps like uh, PFD cuts uh, and uh, and or uh, taxes and or uh, likely uh, changing taxes on the oil industry. So while Walker and, or while yeah Walker and Begich are fi- are relatively the same on spending, there are big differences though on how you fund that spending. Uh, Dunleavy comes at it with an entirely different approach and says, I'm going to cut spending. Now, that having been said, Dunleavy's muddling his message a little bit on these on these spending cuts. In, in, in recent uh, statements uh, that he made running up to, the, um, uh, up to the primary election, he started talking about a much higher budget level than he had uh, historically. He had he'd historically talked about uh, budget levels down in the $3 billion, that he was going to cut spending down into the $3 billion range. In the run-up to the primary, he was talking, he's talking about uh, budget levels that are in the $4.3, $4.2 uh, billion dollar range, which is significantly higher and makes it significantly more difficult I mean, you can cut to that level, but it makes it significantly more difficult for that to be a sustainable level given where our revenue sources uh, have gone, given where oil prices have gone. So it's, he, he's, he's muddling that message a little bit. He's talking about a budget number that really is not sustainable from traditional revenue sources. On, on his discuss, in his discussion with you last week, the Facebook portion of the discussion that he had with you on the show, he talked about funding a portion of it. Uh, uh, some portion of that from the CBR, the Constitutional Budget Reserve, um, and 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 has talked about that in a couple of uh, in a couple of the pre-primary discussions as well. That's that's a problem. I mean, the CBR, the, the, we've relied on the CBR, we borrowed from the CBR to fund these these excessive spending levels that we've that we've had all along. We need to repay the CBR. That's what the Constitution contemplates. Uh, that's what the, the, the whole thing surrounding the CBR contemplates, that it's a, a reserve that's available for uh, Alaska generations along the way. This generation needs to start repaying the CBR and building the, the CBR back up. You can do that if, if you're cutting spending levels down into the $3 billion range, as, as Dunleavy talked about when he was a state senator. But if we're now going, if he's now going to start talking about budget levels in the four plus billion dollar range, you don't have room 
to, to repay the CBR. And in fact, as he talked about on your show, he, he continues CBR draws. He continues borrowing from the CBR. And frankly, you may at the, at the budget levels he's, he's talked about most recently, you may have to draw from the ERA and start using the, the earnings reserve account as a, as an additional, uh, as an additional revenue source, uh, uh, savings account that you're tapping into. So his message has become muddled. He was, he was a much clearer candidate on these fiscal issues when he was talking about the billion-dollar cut plan and getting spending down into the $3 billion uh, range. Now that he's moved up into the $4 billion range, uh, the message is getting muddled because it's not, as, it's not clear at all that he can make it uh, on, on, current revenue, on current revenue sources at $4 billion. And he's, talking, he's, uh, he's already talking about additional revenue so- sources that make the problem worse, make the make the the, the intergenerational uh, borrowing from the future to, to pay for a better lifestyle today. He's he's talking about revenue sources that make that problem worse. So, well, and I, I I would say that part of the problem is, of course, the early messaging is always easier before you get a bunch of other people whispering in your ear and and telling you different things and 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 pulling in different directions. I guest hosted a show in Anchorage yesterday. Uh, for Dave Steeren and and, uh, and I had uh, uh, Mike Dunleavy back on, and I specifically tried to nail him down on that a little bit deeper. And again, he did mention more of the CBR discussion, but so because of the, you know some of the things they could do to turn it around, they could see increased revenues uh, down down the uh, down the road. I definitely think that you you know this is a conversation that you, probably you should have with him to try and straighten him out on some of this stuff. And he actually said on the on the previous uh, interview with him that he really needed to get with you. And so I think I'm hoping that I can make that happen, that I can play matchmaker on this. And you can, uh, if you don't have your own, if you don't have your own in on this, he's already thrown that on the table. This would be the perfect opportunity to have that discussion. It, it, uh, I think that discussion needs to be had by somebody with him. Yeah, this is what he's beginning to sound like. I hate to say this, but what he's beginning to sound like is a lot more like the Alaska Senate majority, which is, you know, talks a good game on cutting, but but when you get down to it, doesn't make the cuts, and and instead of fessing up to it and saying we've got to find new revenue sources then to to to, to support this higher spending level, we're just going to keep borrowing from uh, from all of these savings accounts that we've got. We're going to steal from the next generation essentially by taking money that should be set aside for them. That's a lot more Senate majority. I, I made one comment. That, that that was a little tongue in cheek, but it was like, uh, you know, is Kevin Meyer running fiscal policy now? <laughs> uh, Mike Mike needs to get back to Mike. I mean, Mike walked away from the Senate majority. He walked away for a good reason, which was they were spending way too much, um, and and they were and they were funding it in ways that hurt the next generation, future generations. That was a great message when he walked away. He needs to get back to being that candidate. Uh, and and not the candidate that's, that's that's being driven now more toward the, toward the Alaska Senate majority uh, uh, approach. Now I understand politically. I understand why you do that. You do that because you don't want to a- answer the question that, that that's going to get asked on the on the campaign trail about where are you going to make the cuts. And and you know if you say the university, then you know you're putting at risk the Fairbanks vote. If you say K through 12, then you're putting at risk. Uh, some of the some of the teacher vote and the surrounding support system around around K through 12. If you say Medicaid, then you get you know a bunch of static about from from the hospitals uh, about you're taking away one of our funding sources. So I understand why you want to fudge that number as high as you can because you don't want to answer those questions. But by gosh, that's the Mike Dunleavy that everybody fell in love with which was that I'm going to cut through this and I'm going to make these cuts and by gosh we're going to get Alaska back to a government that can afford. If he if he starts you know, waffling on that, um, part of the base that 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 fell in love with him because of that attitude, uh, I think starts going, you know, what what have we got here? Have we have we got another Kevin Meyer or <laughs> are we electing Kevin Meyer as, right, as governor? Right. And frankly, I wouldn't want to be one I wouldn't vote for a Kevin Meyer for governor. So it's uh, he's he's got to get back to his core message. Uh, the question was for those of you who didn't hear it in the chat room: What was the messaging that we should be, you know, giving to Mike Dunleavy when we're out there interacting with him, or sending him emails, or talking to him to try him bring him back on track? As as you you know, Brad, as you said earlier in the conversation, to bring him back to the old Mike Dunleavy. What is the messaging that we need to bring forward? 
keep focused on cost cutting. Keep, uh, uh, go back to your plan that you had when you were in the state senate of a billion dollars. Maybe it's not a billion dollars. Maybe it's a half billion dollars. Or so. But it's something in the three billion dollar range. Stop talking about this about this four point three billion and funding it through additional draws from the CBR. That's that's not going to land us. For you, for, that's not going to land us in a, in a spot where we avoid having to come up with new revenues. There isn't enough base revenues. Uh, oil isn't going to recover enough. Production isn't going to skyrocket enough to be able to fund a $4.3 billion operating budget. Get your budget back to where you were when you, were in, when you walked, walked away from the state Senate. Come to think of it, he may have walked away. From the from the Senate majority, when they had an operating budget of 4.3 billion dollars, he may have said that that sounds about right what they had at the time. He may have said that's too much. Well, it is too much, and he needs to get back to that fundamental. He needs to be cost cutter, Mike Dunleavy, as opposed to uh, oh, maybe we can make it, you know, at, at 4.3 billion dollars, Mike Dunleavy. Okay, we're clear for that, uh, Brad. I got a couple of questions from the chat room here that I think we need to address. Uh, that I think uh, m- makes sense before I ask my final question. Uh, Paul says, are, sure. we sp- are we spending too much on UAA, UAF, et cetera? Can they make enough cuts? Most Alaskans don't really know where all the money goes. Government always grows. Costs go up to run each year. I wish they'd come out and say where to cut or change up where we fund constitutionally. What do you say? Well, y- 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 we-, we shouldn't go down the road of thinking we can cut UAF enough, UAA enough, and UAS enough. Uh, to, to, to make a material difference. They have certain, all those three institutions have certain base costs uh, that, that makes that difficult. What we need to be thinking about is going back to the constitutional contemplation of one university. We, we, have, we have built three universities in this state. We've built three universities for a population of 750,000 people. I've not done a, a per capita analysis, but we've got three huge universities for that small a population. We, need, we can have one really good university um, for, for the amount that we're spending on three mediocre ones. And we need, and we need to start down that road. We need to say, okay, we're going to, we're not going to have three separate institutions. We're not going to have three separate accreditations, uh, that try to, you know, have across the board programs in all these areas that these three universities do. We're going to have one strong one and we're going to have branch campuses, uh, uh, where we need them and, and as we need them in, in other locations, a much cheaper system a much less expensive system so yes we can uh we can't do it by just saying we're going to keep uaa keep uas keep uaf and cut cut spending on each we we've got to get back to one university we're down to the last uh, few little minutes here so let's uh, let's wind things up with number three which of course is the alaska oil and gas analysis why have we been so much in the news lately well there's a lot of good things going on on the north slope we've had a lot of good press in the last couple of weeks uh, analysts saying the North Slope is a is a new place to be. It's a reemerging super major, um, uh, super major basin, super basin rather. Um, uh, there's a lot of opportunity up there. All of that's right. All of that's correct. There are great things going on in the North Slope, but uh, we also have declines going on in Prudhoe and in Kaparik in our traditional fields. And a lot of this new production that people are all excited about are just going to help us keep production flat. Don't let those headlines go to your head and think, oh, my gosh, we're out of this. We're going to have all this new production. Oil prices are recovering. We're going to be back on the gravy train. We don't need to worry about any of these other issues. We can keep spending at $4.3 billion. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is we're finding replacement sources as Prudhoe continues to decline. We're finding additional sources we need as oil prices stick around the $75, $80 level. They're not going back to the $120 level that we had in the late 2000s. So these are good headlines. These These are headlines we need to see, but these are not headlines that mean that the happy days are here again. We can go back to four, five, six billion dollar spending levels. We can't. This is the time we need to keep the lid on. They're going to enable us not to have to cut even deeper or, or have even more taxes laid on us. But but they're not they're not happy days are here again, uh, and we're going to be able to you know to blow these budgets up again and have big capital budgets. 
good headlines. We need it. We need to. We need to relish these headlines. Enjoy these headlines. Encourage the investment that that they're talking about. But but don't let it go to your head and think that the headlines are telling us more than they really are. Again, I think that we need to be reminded, even if happy days do come here again with big high oil prices, we can't continue to the previous habits of spending that we have in the past. I mean, that's why we have to change these players out, because that's the problem. We get more money. We spend like drunken sailors. What do you think here? Last few seconds. Well, we need to elect candidates who are going to go in and, and, and bring spending down, just like the oil companies have brought spending down. That's how they're doing better. We need to bring state spending down even further. We've cut the easy stuff. We now need to go in and do some really good analysis and cut some more spending. Dunleavy, we need we need to have the, the old Mike Dunleavy back, and we need to have candidates that will follow him down that track. Um, Brad, we're down here ready to uh, – we're about uh, two and a half minutes out here. Uh, any final thoughts? You want to do a quick wrap-up and give us your final thoughts on where we need to be? Well, this race is still evol- – the governor's race is still evolving. Uh, the participants are uh, are still sort of settling in. Uh, it's going to be a bigger – it's a much bigger race if, if – or a much different race, excuse me, if Begich drops out than if Begich stays in. If Begich stays in, I think there's an opportunity really to press forward on the PFD as a centerpiece, uh, a center discussion, disc- uh, issue uh, of this campaign. I hope that happens. I hope Begich stays in. And I hope he presses forward on, uh, on on targeting Governor Walker as an elitist, looking out only for the top 20 percent and not for working Alaska families. Frankly, I think that helps Dunleavy because then working Alaska families say, well, it's not Walker. Our union bosses are trying to tell us Walker. It's not Walker. So let me look at Begich and let me look at Dunleavy. And I think when you compare Begich and Dunleavy, Dunleavy wins. But we've got to we got to ramp up the message on the PFD being a central issue of this campaign. And I think Begich staying in does that. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. As always, Brad, it was a pleasure to speak with you today. Thanks for coming on board. Michael, thanks for having me. All right, we're going to be back with more. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.